I'm Matt Kletzley. Thank you for taking time out of your day to uh, spend a few minutes with us to talk about nonprofit DNO 101. To some degree, this is going to be uh, a DNO 101. Uh, I'll, I'll skew most of the information about the policies over toward the nonprofit side of things, but there's so much that overlaps between a publicly traded company, a private company, or a nonprofit company when it comes to directors and officers liability and the associated coverages that also go into those policies. While the public companies focus on strictly the directors and officers liability standalone generally, their package policies for private and nonprofit are very similar in, in several aspects. And so I'll lean most of my, my discussion towards the nonprofit side of things, uh, which also encompasses a lot of how the packages are put together for private companies as well. So one thing that I wanted to make sure we started was with the agenda of what, we, what we're going to talk about today. So without going through the roles and the duties and the directors, uh, duties of the directors and officers, it's hard to talk about what we do with the directors and officers liability or the need for it. So we're going to start with the, the, the role and their duties. We'll talk about each of the different coverage sections that are in the policy, and then we'll go to questions and answers. For those of you who are new to the way we run our webinars, we try to take the webinars to a 15 to 20 minute information session and then a 15, 10 to 15 minute question and answer session. So there's plenty of time for questions and answers, but we want to be respectful of your time. Everybody's busy. So when we think about directors and officers liability, what you're in, we're ensuring when we look at directors and officers liability is we're ensuring decisions. So it makes it very difficult, different from the general property and casualty lines versus the directors and officers liability lines. So when you look at the perspective, business and uh, bodily injury and property damage are what are the triggers for, say, a GL policy. Those are actually specifically excluded triggers when it comes to directors and officers liability because the whole focus on the DNO is going to be law lawsuits and liability. So when a claim comes in, that's actually the trigger for the policy. When you look at directors and officers liability, it began in the 60s when a lot of publicly traded organizations, the shareholders had no recourse against the organization because of corporate law because the corporation was a person under the law. There's no liability for the owners to be able to, to have any more liability than what they originally put into the company, which was the cost of the share. But when things went badly, the shareholders felt they had no recourse and eventually case law built so that they could actually take recourse against the directors and officers who were making the decisions that moved the activities of the corporation. And that was referred to as piercing the corporate veil. What was determined through case law over time is that the board is responsible for not only the strategic decision making of the organization, but also for all of the activities and, and things that are happening with the organization. And they're ultimately accountable for the organization's actions. And so as case law built out, what also built out was the duties of the directors and officers. So when you think about an organization that's either publicly traded or private, they've got shareholders that are, have provided them with capital and they're supposed to prosper those, those assets. Anyone who has responsibility for someone else's assets and is responsible for making sure those assets are safeguarded or prospered has a fiduciary responsibility. And so the fiduciary duties of any board of directors fall into three major categories, their duty of care, their duty of loyalty, and their duty of obedience. So as you're looking at the duty of care, well, the reasonably prudent person standard is what has developed in case law over time. 
It's also referred to as the business judgment rule, and this is the top defense for a board in determining whether and being able to defend against a claim that's been brought against them for either malfeasance or poor decision making. So the business judgment rule is what would a reasonably prudent person do in the same circumstances with the same information that they had at the time of the decision? And so when they apply that, you don't get to use the 2020 hindsight perspective that's bringing the claim in the first place. So when you think about decisions throughout your life personally, and you look back on, on the decisions that are made, and I, I can say this myself, maybe that wasn't the best decision is, is sometimes what, what you have that you're, as you're looking back, because you've got new information on how that decision played out. But the, the duty of care is about what information you have at the time and that you're reasonably looking at it and you're, you're, you're pondering it. You're actually taking time and actually utilizing all the information. Or if there's not enough information to make the decision, you've asked for the additional information. You've tried to, to gather the right information to be able to make good decisions. The second duty is the duty of loyalty. And this is where you get into a little bit of a conflict with human nature. So human nature is that we act in our own self-interest. But when serving as a director or officer of an organization, the duty of loyalty is actually that the directors and officers will act in the best interest of the organization. Um, and there was a, there was a movie that, that went into this and had a, a had a, it was based on a, real, a true story, and it had a really good example of this, where uh, in extraordinary measures, um, the CEO had to make a decision on whether or not what was going to be best for the organization and the mission of the organization, or what was going to be best for his family. Um, and it, as I said, it was based on the true story. And he actually made the presentation to the board for what was best for the organization and for that mission. It turned out working out for his family and his family ended up being able to, to, to participate in, in the clinical trials that were going on. But it was a, a clear uh, state of the duty of loyalty being played out in real life and actually being executed properly under, under the requirements of case law. The last duty is the duty of obedience. And so the duty of obedience is operating within the file purpose. So for public and private companies, you're talking about the duty of being obedient to the shareholders. So if you've ever seen proxy statements where they have activists trying to put topics on uh, the agenda for votes from the shareholders that are way off from what the company's mission is, whether it's clean drinking water for some country or, or some other topic. But if the shareholders actually vote for those types of topics, then the board of directors is obligated to actually take action on it. With a nonprofit, it's a little bit different. There's a filed purpose with the IRS when they get their nonprofit status or with their state if they went for state nonprofit status. And that purpose, they have to stay within the boundaries of that mission and that purpose. And if they get too far uh, spread away from that, they actually risk losing their nonprofit status. And so that's, that's a risky situation because if they're also dependent on donors, the donors then lose the nonprofit deduction that they would get from providing the money. And often losing their nonprofit status will be the end of a nonprofit. Um, or they have to convert to a private and make it as a private company to, to survive as a private company. The most important thing, though, is that because the directors and officers are making these decisions, they actually have personal liability. So we, we often have situations where someone will come to us on a fairly small operation and they'll ask for five or ten million dollars in limits and we'll ask why do you want such high limits? And they said, well, we have a high net worth individual joining the board and they won't join unless we have that level of limit. So boards often have that requirement 
the boards that I sit on, I require that, that they have a director and officer's liability policy because if the company goes under or if the company does not have the financial strength to be able to pay for a claim that may come against me for my decision making, I want to make sure that there is a, a defense mechanism that's, that's available. And that volunteer opportunity to help the community doesn't turn into a personal liability for me um, as a trustee. Now, one of the things that, that's interesting about, about directors and officers liability today is that modern philanthropy has shifted a little bit. So when you look at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and a lot of these billionaires who have built out very large donation um, operations, what they've done is they've shifted toward a real focus on governance. And they want to see governance before they're giving gifts and grants. And they want to make sure that all that they're giving to is where the money is actually getting to. And so having a bloated structure, having an organization that has so much administrative cost that only 50 cents on the dollar actually gets to the cause, is often a stumbling block with modern philanthropy on the nonprofit side. There's also the possibility that they can come back if they feel like the money has been misused and bring suits against the directors and officers or, or even ask for the money back, even if it's been deployed and, and utilized. Now, Sarbanes-Oxley is only for public companies, but there's been case law where judges have stated it should apply for nonprofits and they also, there also have been a lot of discussions about states taking up a Sarbanes-Oxley type leg legislation for nonprofit organizations. But one thing to be that's noteworthy for nonprofit directors and officers liability is while it's not applicable, the court still will take those standards as a basic guideline and say this is really how people should run their governance. So nonprofits are starting to have a lot more of the perspective of transparency and the perspective of being expected to run like a, a well-run private or public or, uh, operation in managing the responsibilities in their decision making. So when you look at all these types of things, these are good examples of all aspects of the operation become the responsibility of the board. And while the board doesn't need to get into all of the day-to-day -day activity or, or even a lot of the transactional activity, they do need to manage the entire operation. They have a responsibility for it, whether together or individually. One of the other things that we see a lot of, of the part of the direction and officers policy packages is you start moving into other coverages. When you're looking at private nonprofits, most of the time, almost all of them are going to have a DNO and an ETL component. On the nonprofit side, a lot of people will elect for the cost to, to reduce the cost of the policy to not have the ETL component. But employment practices liability is basically from everything from the beginning of starting the interviewing process through post-employment activity like referrals. And so everything that falls within that scope for the employment activities falls under employment practices liability. What we see most today in the news is the cultural shift on hashtag me too and hashtag times up. And so there's been a very, very large increase at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission where any types of discrimination are reported um, and enforced for the federal laws. There's a 26% increase in the sexual harassment and discrimination claims that fall under the hashtag me too and hashtag times up. But what's really interesting is total claims are down. So it's a very, very large increase in focus there. One of the things that all nonprofits generally have is there is some sort of interaction with third parties that may not require employees, but other decisions can get made that can impact third parties. And if discrimination or harassment come into that, to that interaction, 
that can bring liability back to the organization and back to individuals, including at the board level. And so it's still a decision-making process with all these employment and post non-employment activities when it comes to dealing with people or dealing with organ other organizations. So it's, it's an aspect of the policy that really does address a, a broad, broad scope of still part of that decision-making process that falls to the directors and officers. The third major section of the, of, of the directors and officers liability is the fiduciary liability coverage. Fiduciary liability, again, is being responsible for taking care of and, and safeguarding and prospering someone else's assets. So when you're looking at employment practices, that's for your decision-making in the employment relationship, whereas fiduciary is about the actual employee benefits. So the benefits packages, whether it's welfare, health and welfare plans, or it's retirement plans. So as you look at what's in the fiduciary policy, this is less about the employer's liability that's in the general liability package, where uh, if someone forgets to sign someone up, that's the kind of coverage that, that kicks in. This is actually for breach of prudence in the decision-making process. So many people will say to us, well, we don't need to worry about fiduciary liability because we have Fidelity that's managing our, our 401k. But who chose Fidelity? Who chose the investments that Fidelity is offering to the plan participants? Who's monitoring the performance of those investments? Who's monitoring for Fidelity's activities? Who's making sure that the investments don't have excessive fees related to them? that's all still decision-making that falls back onto the trustees of that plan, but also can fall to the directors and officers of the organization. And when you're talking about nonprofits, especially, those usually are the same people. Whoever's administering the plan are also the directors and officers of the organization. And while there are several other coverages that can be included in the policy, those are really the three main coverages that, that are on most policies depending on the types of risk, depending on how they want to ensure other pieces of it, the crime, the kidnap ransom can be brought in. And there are a lot of other things that can be substantive or even just beneficial to have built into the policy. But the concept still remains with the decision-making, the governance, the handling of the organization as a whole. So at that point, I'm going to stop. I'm going to offer up whether or not anyone has any questions. And if you have questions, you can simply use the chat box in the GoToWebinar entry and send the questions in, and Darcy will help with uh, getting information to me, and I can answer the questions for you. Thanks, Matt. So the first question is going to be, what are the most frequent claims for nonprofits? Okay. Our most frequent claims for nonprofits are employment practice claims. So there's a very high frequency, uh, just like there is with uh, the private company package policies. Uh, so that's also where we tend to have uh, the most volume of claims payments. Even if nothing happens with a claim for an employment practices claim, they're still responding to the claim, taking care of, a, you know, making sure that, that the research is done to see if the claim is legitimate or not. Um, if it is legitimate, making sure going into negotiations. Uh, one of the things that's also a benefit of the employment practices policy is it helps to control the costs because often, uh, there have been studies done by various carriers that when someone who isn't a practice lawyer on an employment practices claim gets involved on it, they often end up raising the cost overall because they don't have the experience to know when to negotiate, what to negotiate, how high to negotiate, and even learning the different laws and what had to be complied with and whatnot can add to the billable hours. So there's a benefit also of, of having experts 
at your fingertips to help anytime this arises, especially for organizations that don't have a lot of spare capital, which is what most nonprofits, uh, that's their financial situation. All right, next question. Are the board members the only ones covered by the EPL and fiduciary portion of the policy? Or are managers of say satellite offices covered as well? Okay, that, that's a great question. The, the policies generally will cover directors, officers, employees, and volunteers under the, the employment practices session, uh, section of the policy. The managers of the family offices, unless they're acting in a capacity to run the nonprofit, are not covered. But if they're acting in that capacity and they're actually running the operations of the nonprofit, then there is that possibility to have it extended over to them. You could always have that manuscripted. One of the other things that can be done is a vicarious liability endorsement could be built for, for that scenario, where any liability that comes against the nonprofit that also ties in someone managing that nonprofit operation from a family office, as long as the nonprofit stays involved in the suit, then the coverage would extend out to that person. But if the nonprofit gets dropped away and the member of the family office is the only one left in the suit, then the coverage would not be there. Okay. Do you anticipate a future erosion of the ERISA exclusion in DNO policies? I don't expect that there would be an erosion of that of that exclusion mainly because the fiduciary coverage is available under a separate policy and it's extremely economical. So for instance, if, uh, if a nonprofit has no 403B plan, no 401k plan, uh, and they still wanna get the coverage and they're thinking about possibly instituting a plan, they can get the coverage added on to, to the policy for $75. So having the coverage available, it's a really inexpensive coverage, mostly because of the nature of, of the coverage. There's, there are very few suits that come under fiduciary liability typically. When they do come though, they're extremely expensive. So it's a high, high severity, low frequency line of business. And so it's, it's rather economical. I don't think that, that there will be a blend of the DNO policy that way. Okay, are wage and hour claims covered under your EPLI policy? In most jurisdictions, yes. Certain jurisdictions, we do not want to cover wage and hour claims. There are also certain classes of business where the wage and hour is somewhat prohibitive. So we are very clear with our quote letters whether or not we're going to cover the wage and hour. So. It's on a case-by-case -case basis. For the most part, most of our book does have wage and hour coverage, but there are certain classes and jurisdictions that we prefer not to provide that coverage. Okay, here's a more specific question. Most of our nonprofit organizations are 100% volunteer-based, no payroll, no benefits. What type of DNO policy should we be offering? Okay. It, that's a great question. So <clears throat> when you look at not having any employment practices uh, from not having any employees, it's all volunteer based. The DNO, first of all, the directors and officers sitting on the board and making the decisions and managing the, the process and the operation, they have the liability for managing that operation. Um, it's interesting because the Often, when I've seen a nonprofit go under, there will sometimes be something in the paper about it. Sometimes it goes to the, the orphans court or the bankruptcy court for nonprofits uh, because they're a nonprofit. Um, the bankruptcy proceedings go through the orphans court in a lot of states. Sometimes the attorney general gets involved um, if they're having a large impact on uh, the community at large that by going under. So there are different aspects that people come in and look at. But by having volunteers involved as well, 
there's less control over volunteers. Uh, there's often less oversight from even checking the backgrounds of the volunteers that are involved with the organization. And so what can happen is, and we've seen this with our claims, is third-party claims can arise where the volunteers end up causing a discrimination or a, a harassment situation that brings back liability toward the organization. One of the other things that's really difficult about uh, today's environment is that everything goes to social media, everything gets goes out of the, the lines of privacy. And so especially these, these types of coverages, when you're looking at something that's salacious, like board members were taking, were doing things that actually benefited them and actually caused the organization to go under, or volunteers, uh, someone brings a suit against a volunteer, or a volunteer is rejected from being able to, to volunteer to an operation, and it's considered discrimination that they're not allowed to be participants in, in helping to volunteer. So what happens is it goes out, it becomes broader, and then all of a sudden it splashes and you don't know what's going to hit headline news. Well, if you're also an organization that's taking donations, headlines to those levels actually has an impact. We've seen impact when headlines are hitting on, on the accounts on the revenue streams that come in from donations after that. So it kind of has a ripple effect. So with all volunteers and no employees, it actually brings down the cost of the employment practices liability. So I'd encourage you to at least get a quote and contemplate it and make that part of your, your due diligence in deciding what to buy on the policy. Okay, uh, following up on that same question, would it need to include a fiduciary coverage? Uh, each of the coverage parts are independent, so typically d &L can be standalone. Nonprofits generally, d and and EPL go together. Not a lot of carriers write a, a, a high volume of just standalone EPL coverage for nonprofit organizations. And then the fiduciary can be tacked on, it can be a, a standalone policy. Uh, usually bringing them together in one policy cuts the administrative cost and therefore can cut the cost of, of delivering all three coverages on the policy. But it's modular, so all the coverages are optional. Okay. Um, so we have time for one last question. Is there a risk when nonprofits can't continue their fund to operations? Yes. So actually, our two largest losses in our book came from bankruptcy claims, uh, and they were very large claims. And so if the bankruptcy court decides that uh, someone needs to pay for the damages caused, um, that's where things get a little tricky, because even the policy terms and conditions can be thrown out by the bankruptcy court, and they can make a ruling to decide who's going to pay what on, on a policy. Now that's on the insurance policy. If it's not an insured policy, then you can have action where the bankruptcy court could hold trustees uh, responsible. There are state laws that are designed to restrict volunteer liability when it comes to volunteering for a nonprofit. Often those are reduced for the directors and officers and they're and even at the federal level, they're reduced for the directors and officers. So decision makers do have a different standard, even with a nonprofit. So when they go under, there's also the possibility that they have to figure out if there are some assets left. They know they can't continue operations with their assets left. Figuring out what is complementary to their mission at another nonprofit to get those assets transferred over, make sure that they're, they're taken care of still in that fiduciary responsibility there's there's other activity that could also bring liability. All right, so we are out of time for today's webinar. We will be sending out a follow-up to everyone who's registered with a copy of the slides and a recording. Thank you, Matt. You did a great job as always.
um, and keep an eye out for our next webinar in November. Thanks everyone for your time.